Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the launch event of the Mentally Healthier Councils Network, hosted by Centre for Mental Health. If that's what you're hoping to come to, you're in the right place. If you're not, never mind. Stay with us anyway. It's going to be wonderful. Um, my name is uh, Andy Bell, and I am uh, interim chief executive at Centre for Mental Health. And um, while we're waiting for everyone to join us. Um, I will just do a little bit of an introduction and um, then the main business of the event will will, uh, will be to follow. So, so uh, well done. You're already our favourites because you've arrived on time. So, so um, give yourself a pat on the back for, for being here at um, 12 o'clock exactly. Uh, and it's lovely to have you um, on this first day of British summertime. And at the moment, I've got sun streaming through my window. So that can't be a bad thing, can it? There is there is hope. Um, let me start at the beginning then. Um, uh, this is an event hosted by Centre for Mental Health. Um, if you know about us already, well done. If you don't, we are an independent charity uh, and uh, we are here to challenge inequalities and injustices uh, in mental health. We do that across all of society uh, for, for um, uh, a whole range of different uh, issues relating to the public's mental health and the lives of people with mental health difficulties. Um, we are very proud of our work and we are particularly proud that over the last 10 years we have hosted a network for elected members in local councils um, and we've had a hundred or more councils that have joined us as part of what we called the local authorities mental health challenge. Um, if you were a member of that group, then thank you for being part of it. And, and I hope you will join us for the new group that we're creating. Um, this is a really exciting day for us. We know that that um, local councils are fundamental to the mental health of the public uh, and, and uh, rightful lives for people with mental health difficulties. Um, what you do in local government, whether you are a councillor or, or an officer, uh, or otherwise involved in local government in mental health is fundamental to well-being, fundamental to, to challenging the injustices and inequalities that lead to so much uh, distress and difficulty in people's lives. Uh, and our role uh, as an organisation that, that builds research evidence um, is to support you, to walk alongside you uh, and to be part of your journey to do whatever you can to, to um, create mentally healthier places uh, for your residents and communities. Uh, as I say, we're proud that we have uh, worked alongside elected members for the last decade. It's almost exactly a decade, actually. Um, and we're thrilled that we are now able to take that to the next level. Uh, and you will notice that, that we've got a new name, the Mentally Healthier Councils Network, which we are launching today. Uh, the difference is that we are still very much wanting to work with uh, and support um, uh, elected members of councils, but we are now also welcoming people who work in councils in officer roles. Uh, that may be as a public health person uh, or it may be in any other role in local government that's relevant to the public's mental health. This is very much here for you and to support you to do your job. Um, and to do it hopefully feeling like you're part of something nationwide. Uh, we know that, that many, many people work in local government and, and don't necessarily have the support for, for, from peers uh, across the country. So we hope that we will be able to provide you with that. Um, I think the other thing to say is that we really recognize that the last 10 years has been a time where we have seen enormous innovation in local government in terms of its response to mental health, particularly since public health found its way into local councils in England. Uh, I've really noticed a blossoming, not just of caring about mental health, though definitely that, but also taking action and taking steps to promote and protect the public's mental health. I think that was most notable during the um, the lockdowns uh, and, and, and the um, really, really serious years of the pandemic where, where we saw uh, a real, real range of different approaches to supporting people's mental health at that most difficult and, and frankly awful of times sometimes. But we also know that you've been doing that during years of austerity 
uh, that local government doesn't have the funding it deserves, particularly in public health, but in many other areas too. Um, and so you're having to do that with, with very limited uh, resources, and, and that is not at all easy. So we really recognise just how challenging a time it has been for colleagues in local government. OK, uh, we're going to have some really interesting talks coming up for you. But before we do that, I have to give you the housekeeping talk, uh, as we do at the beginning of all online events. So the first thing to say is that this event is being recorded. Um, we want to be able to share this with, with people who aren't able to be here today. And indeed, we want to remember the important things that, that will be shared. Um, so please note we are being recorded. Um, we have the chat on at the moment. What we thought we'd do um, is turn the chat off during formal presentations. Uh, and the reason for that is that we want you to be able to focus fully on the presentation. And, and um, it's a lot easier when you're presenting not to have chat going off. But um, during this part, please do introduce yourselves. Let us know who you are and where you're from. I can see a couple of colleagues have done that already. So well done to both of you um, for introducing yourselves. It's great to have you here. So please just do just let us know in the chat who you are. Um, we've had some great questions that have been sent to us already. So, so um, I will be uh, I've got a note of those and I will be asking as many of those as I can. But when we finish the presentation, do please, if you can, um, put any questions down into the chat and I will take notice of those and I'll ask as many as I can. If there are any that, that neither our speakers nor, nor, nor the staff team can answer today, um, we will make sure we do answer them as part of the uh, network going forward. And indeed, they'll provide us with really useful information about what you, as, as um, I hope members of our new network, want to know about and what you want to make part of the conversation. It's worth saying this is day one uh, of the Mentally Healthier Councils Network, and we envisage a lot of days to come. So, so uh, this, this is really just the start of the conversation, not the end. Um, so I think that's quite enough by way of introduction. It's lovely to have you here. Uh, it's great. I can see some some people I know and some people I don't know. And that's wonderful. That's what you want in any great uh, conversation. So um, thank you, everyone, for being here today. Um, our three speakers are frankly quite brilliant. So, so strap in, everyone. It's going to be good. Um, and I'm really delighted that, that uh, our first speaker, um, among many other things, is a former colleague. Um, and someone who I absolutely loved working with at Centre for Mental Health and who has now gone on to become none other than the leader of Islington Council in London uh, and the co-lead for Thrive London, um, the quite brilliant councillor Kaya Coma schwartz So Kaya, thank you for being here with us today and over to you. Well, thank you, Andy, for such a grandiose uh, <laughs> introduction. Um, um, Thanks. Uh, I'm really delighted to be able to join you. I think it's really important uh, that we start um, our discussion today in, in the context of where we find ourselves as a country. I mean, to say that the last few years have been overwhelming is, is to be very kind, I think. Um, we've had Brexit, we've had um, a pandemic, uh, we're now deep in a cost of living crisis, and that obviously puts massive strain on all our residents, all our partners. And I think also it's important to recognize on us as councillors. I think um, the LGA have a wonderful diagram about the new uh, role of a councillor, the 21st councillor. Uh, it's wonderful, but it's really overwhelming as well. So we're pulled upon uh, in all directions. Uh, I think, you know, without a doubt, the pandemic has been profoundly um, the impact has been so deep on our psychological well-being. I went to a school the other day um, where it was a secondary boys school and they said without really even getting how how much of a difference it was that they used to play after school every day and now they all go home and don't and it really it really really struck me how how deeply impacted our society has been um, you know we're grieving, there's masses of loss, there's masses of personal income loss, that's all been compounded by um, 
a, a cost of living crisis. The LGA um, last week said we're in a second health emergency. We all know that uh, as counsellors. We definitely know that in terms of our adult social um, care spend. Um, so uh, now that I have thoroughly, I hope, depressed you all, um, what I would say is, is that's why networks like this are so important um, because one of the things we learned through the pandemic is we are so much stronger if we're doing things together. And I think that's always been the case in local government. And something that I'm really passionate about in local government is that we share what we do because, you know, we're one island really. And I know that as a leader, I know which bus borough is best in the country for sure. But um, I do think <laughs> that we all think that. So there's so much that we can learn from each other. Um, and it's been brilliant to see that really for myself, uh, being co-political uh, leader Thrive London, um, which is a, obviously a regional programme um, that is deeply steeped in early intervention, which is, I think, in mental health, exceptionally important because so many of the answers in mental health are about day-to-day uh, -day practice um, and keeping ourselves and our communities happy. Uh, and healthy and us doing that through uh, early intervention and first aid measures is is extremely important. Um, in Islington, we're really lucky. We um, have followed the model of Centre for Mental Health and uh, got an elected uh, mental health champion in Councillor Joe Croft, who is also a mental health professional in his um, life outside of a councillor, which I'm not sure what is, but he, he does that as well. So we're very lucky to have him. And he's already, I mean, he was only elected last year and he's already picked up the mantle and done some amazing work uh, working with our gambling strategy and looking at the mental health impact and gambling on, in our community. Um, so there's like a key thing that local government have, you know, a, a obvious remit in that we can really look at um, in terms of the mental health of our borough. Um, obviously we, you know, do this, uh, our work, um, we're very lucky in Islington, we have a strong voluntary sector. A lot of the work they do is rooted in um, the well-being and mental health space, especially important to us is that diversity. Um, we're a majority non-white borough, so uh, and we don't have particular dominant communities. So having a very varied and supportive voluntary sector is key to us delivering uh, our mental health agenda and supporting the work that they do. Um, one of the programmes that I am just, it has been an honour to be a part of, um, is our Black Men and Mental Health programme, which really on the face of it says everything you need to know about early intervention uh, and partnership working. So basically what we did was uh, work with local barbers, Black barbers, um, to deliver first aid mental health support, train them up, um, in, in mental health support, but also in signposting into local services um, so that, you know, a, a, a someone, a trusted broker in barbers can sit with black men every week and have conversations about their well-being. And if you know the disproportionately uh, the disproportionality data that comes through on black mental health in terms of conditions not being picked up early, uh, then escalating into very severe conditions and um, the disproportionality in treatment um, and very negative treatments in that space and not culturally appropriate treatments. You'll know why we were so passionate about getting in early and helping um, black men in that way. And so you've got the voluntary sector involved there, we've got health partners involved there, we've got local authorities involved there, and we've got local businesses involved. So as a borough, it's a real collective action. Um, and that's really an illustration of our wider look at um, early intervention as a borough. Wherever we can, I want us to get ahead of, you know, um, mental health issues. I know myself, um, small things like I work out pretty much every day is a small thing I do that keeps me far away from medication as possible, um, which is, you know, as someone who does a difficult job, as we all do as counsellors, is, is a real risk. And we need to be really open about that and about our mental well-being um, and what we can do to protect ourselves. Um, 
another thing we've been doing and I think this goes I was really delighted to sit in on the training that Ed Davey runs recently but I think what's really important about the work we do with local government is we could really say this is a public health issue uh, and talk to our public health team and not look at it as as something that every department in the council needs to be working on so we are very ambitious as a borough to be net zero by 2030 and we're um, putting in livable neighborhoods um, to increase the greening and active travel of the borough across 70 percent of our borough and one of the key drivers in that is being active, being surrounded by greenery, having less, you know, overwhelming sensory um, uh, interference through traffic is fundamentally good for your well-being and mental health. So not thinking about, you know, mental health primarily as just a health thing, but what we can do as local government in all areas to improve the well-being of our, of our residents and ourselves is really important. Um, importantly as well we obviously support acute services and acute um, work uh, we have a suicide prevention strategy which um, obviously complements our wider uh, work on tackling mental health and uh, stigma related to mental health um, and this once again is a co-produced um, product with the NHS and um, um, the voluntary sector and ourselves um, so in no way am I saying that, you know, everyone will have a nice walk and that will be enough. Um, I'm not. I'm saying as local authorities, we have a duty to our residents to intervene in as many areas across the council to promote um, well-being and a healthy mentality. But also we know that, especially at the moment, that people are going through really difficult times. So where we can be the support and brokerage to um, you know, accessing um, services um, and making sure that those services are right for our boroughs um, um, in, you know, the context of CAMS, in the context of being culturally appropriate. And these come back on, which I think is my sign to be quiet. <laughs> so I will do. <laughs> thank you very much. All right, we never want you to be quiet, but, but um, thank you for for fascinating talk. I know you got you've you've given us some some time today, and and you're you're um, not able to join us for the full hour. I wonder if I might ask you a quick question to, to that mind, just just while you're here, which is, um, uh, what would you find most helpful from both us as Centre for Mental Health and from the other the network of of local council colleagues, both members and and um, officers, what would you as a, as a leader of a council and an elective member yourself uh, hope that, that we could deliver through this that, that would help you to, to kind of um, to have that role to support mental health in, in your area? I think the greatest thing uh, about the Centre for Mental Health and, I, you know, uh, let me be honest, I work there. But part of the reason I work there is, is the evidence base, the fact that um, you provide an evidence base for the interventions and you analyse models that work. And I think, you know, when we're making difficult choices as councillors, uh, especially in the budgetary constraints that we do have to make, having the evidence base to put through especially bold policies in these areas is really important. And any, um, which I know, through your work you do any evidence that gives you a kind of cost saving in the long term which is the right thing to do by residents but also keeps us um, more financially solvent is also really important and then also I would say keep us connected as councillors it's so easy like you know if I don't leave Islington in, in a month, no one would be surprised, right? It's so easy for us to stay in our in our little boroughs uh, and try our best. But that wider connectivity about what we should and we could be doing is really important. Thank you. That, that's fantastically helpful. And um, uh, one one of the things that we will be doing through through this uh, network is is providing you with with information that's tailored to your needs so, so, so rather than just sharing reports which are very long and complex we will be trying to to uh, provide tailored information and if there are topics particularly that, that members of this network want to hear about 
that will be really useful so 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 that we can we can uh, share that and and we will have a range of events we already do some some regional events within london with elected members which are fabulous and i, I get huge amounts out of and i'm not an elected member um but it's just great to be part of so we will have more events like this and and more events where hopefully you're able to share more things with one another because i really believe the wisdom is here in in the hive mind of of, of the uh, colleagues who, who are here today we don't have to tell you a lot of stuff um very often it's about creating connectivity um because what you're doing I, i've seen already there's some interest in the barbers project um so we don't need to create that evidence it's already there in islington um so so i hope that we can facilitate that sharing without having to to um uh, provide all of all of the information so so thank you kaya um great to see you and, and thank you for giving your time to us today um on the subject of wonderful people uh, i'm now absolutely delighted to ask professor jim mcmanus to speak um jim is the director of public health in hertfordshire uh, president of the Association of Directors of Public Health. Um, I mean, I think he should be president of the world, but, you know, we haven't yet managed to organise that. So in the meantime, we can at least have 10 minutes of, of uh, hearing from um, Jim. Feelings mutual, Andy. Um, <clears throat> after, um, um, thank you for that morning, although I hope I, I, I don't disappoint, not least because I've actually got a written script and not a PowerPoint from the points I wanted to make. Um, and there's a part of me that wants to say, do you know what Kaya said? Um, because it was really quite powerful. And uh, sorry, um, trying to adjust my desk, having just come back from a meeting. So I guess from an officer viewpoint, um, I want to share that Hertfordshire signed up to the first incarnation of the network. And we had a county councillor, in fact, we had two county councillors, and we had a district councillor from each of our 10 districts and boroughs as champions. And I think it made a real difference when I sat down to write this session, looking back over what they had achieved. Um, and I think there are seven things that I call the superlative seven that elected members do um, to help officers and help with the public mental health and the, the kind of mentally healthier agenda. And I'll just type those in the chat so you can, you can see them. I think the first thing they do is actually, they can model the behaviors and the attitude and the disposition of how we support one another. It feels like we are a society which likes grievance um, and, and strife and culture wars at the minute. And um, one of the best things councillors can do is they can model the types of behaviours we want to show through all our services. Uh, and we can look up to them and their disposition to people. Because I think in terms of building a mentally healthier council and a mentally healthier place, how we behave towards one another is really important. You know, the, the apprentice model of leadership, for example, where you've got people with very high drive and, and the emotional intelligence of a brick um, is backfires um, and um, that is not a set of values we want to espouse we want the kind of leadership that wants the very best for everybody working in the workplace and the very best for all our residents that's a different model of leadership um, and it's got a good pedigree in the science and it's about actually about time we countered the myth of the aggressive emotionally unintelligent leader um, and councillors can help model that i think the second thing is councillors can add focus do you know, when officers are kind of lost in data, or as one of my colleagues calls it, boffining, uh, and we can get a bit boffiny, can't we? Um, a councillor can come in and go, well, where's the connection between what you're waffling on about and what you're actually going to do on the ground? They can add focus, um, and that is probably one of the most important things they do. I think the third thing they can do is they can deliver scrutiny. Um, the fourth thing they can do, and this is particularly in some of the examples I'm going to talk about, is they can add visibility to what you're doing in ways that you and as an officer can't, with all sorts of places that they get to. Having um, councillors standing on street corners after the murder of a schoolboy was really important as a sign 
of loving our communities and caring for them. Um, I think councillors can also be the lighthouse telling us where we've missed a bit because they see things we don't um, and their evidence is as important and as valid as anything we'll produce from the data and the journals. I think the last two things are they can really build the social capital of a positive psychosocial environment just by being who they are and doing what they do and getting out and about and being visible. And that's particularly on diversity and inclusion. And if I look at our Gypsy, Romani and Traveller populations in Hertfordshire, our faith communities, our LGBT populations and employees with disability, I can see my team busy working on all of those, but I can also see councillors delivering. So we had all of our 11 councils in Hertfordshire signed up. Um, what's that done for us? Well, it's done a number of things. Well, first of all, we had a year of mental health work where we actually focused action together on what councils could do to improve um, the mental health of populations, even things like making money advice available, even things like how customer services people smile at you and engage you when you walk into reception. Um, it paid off during and after COVID when uh, we did psychosocial support, not just for our staff, but working with the Chamber of Commerce through um, uh, and th with the Local Economic Partnership and the Growth Hub to provide stuff for SME uh, businesses on mental health of their staff. It really helped us focus um, the million pounds we've just invested in health inequality programs led by our districts and boroughs post COVID. So there's, there's, there's a million this year on top of the 300,000 we give every year um, to projects led by district and borough councils. And that million is COVID money that is going to be spent on COVID health inequality recovery and mental health is in every district's plan. And that's partly officer and partly uh, member partnerships working together. So I think what officers do um, uh, when you've got good members interested in public health is really helped. And I think the relationship is very important. Uh, during COVID, we created a public mental health collaborative, which was a national collaborative. And we had lots of people sharing things and a number of people shared things that councillors could do. And in reality, um, if you look across the board from how to support schools with bereaved children, right through to how to deal with self-harm and suicide. The role of counsellors is quite crucial. Last year, we had an 18-year-old who was very sadly murdered in Hertfordshire um, near their school. First time that's happened here, it was massively shocking. We've had students die. But the shockwave that went through this dispersed community um, was significant. So we had councillors as well as the faith community people belong to um, on hand as well as the school team. And just things like a borough councillor walking around an estate with a community warden and then the lead county councillor turning up at the school multiple times and just being on hand for parents was hugely significant. So from an officer perspective, I've said multiple times that um, Councillors are your best ally in public health. They are a kind of a bit of an unseen army for public health. And I think the same for mental health as well. There's a lot of things that they can do. And I'll finish on the point of workforce. Um, I, I had the experience of delivering trauma training to people in care homes after COVID and after the first big wave. And um, we've, ADPH has produced guides on trauma for directors of public health. I've produced one for faith communities. You're very welcome to write to me and I'll send you it free. But what struck me was the view of a number of people in care rooms and a number of people in other services like schools that the councillor visiting them and just sitting down and listening felt the a live connection with the council where they felt they were cared for and they felt their issues were supported. Now that does mean you have to look after your councils, your councillors, and not expect them to self-empty without filling something back. 
But if our key thing, key, um, uh, Derek Mowbray and Katie Cooper, the, the organisation of psychologists, will tell you the most important thing we can do for people in any organisational environment is build a positive psychosocial environment. Counsellors are absolutely crucial to that. You can't do it without them. And as an officer, I'm very grateful. And I'll stop there, if I may. Otherwise, as Andy know, and Ed knows, I will go on all day. And I'd be prepared to listen. Um, thank you, Jim. Um, some really interesting stuff there. And, and just to say the work we've done with member champions does not stop. If you're a member champion now, you'll be a member champion in the new uh, set up, the Mentally Healthier Councils Network. Uh, if you weren't sure, you can continue. But the crucial thing is we're not limiting it to one councillor per uh, authority anymore. So if you want all of your councillors to be on our mailing list, why not? Go for it. Uh, and, and if you want to be involved, please do. Um, I'm really fascinated by a couple of things, you, well, many of the things you said, but that, that coalition between members and officers working together, the, the, the the benefits of the kind of coalition, if you like, between them, and, and you can achieve more together than, than separately. And that importance of, of making plans, but knowing that unexpected things are going to happen. And it's often in those moments of crisis or where you have to be responsive and drop everything, that your ability to support people's mental health is most tested and you can learn the most. And so uh, it's not always uh, about um, about what's planned but, but uh, about what happens um, when life throws you something really, really difficult. So, so, and I imagine the culture is then fundamental to that. So, so thank you, Jim. Uh, right, we've had two brilliant speakers and I'm pleased to say we've got a third because all good things come in threes, don't they? So, so um, I'm now especially delighted having uh, enjoyed hearing from a former colleague to hear from a current colleague uh, and the uh, quite simply brilliant um, Ed Davey. Well, thank you very much, Andy. Again, um, kind of a hyperbolic uh, uh, introduction, which I, I'm sure I will struggle to live up to, especially as I'm currently struggling to share my screen to get the slides up, uh, which is not a great start. And it probably shows that Kaya and Jim were quite right to not have um, slides. I will give it one more try, and then otherwise I will just improvised i managed to do it in the little pre-meeting that we had so i'm not quite sure what i've done wrong here where is it gone um but whilst i'm fiddling trying to get the slides uh, which i will give it another try um yeah it's just worth worth mentioning perhaps a little bit of history here in that um i was delighted to be when i was an elected member as i was for 12 years uh, the second ever uh, mental health champion in in the original scheme and I was very delighted to do that and uh, I found it incredibly um, useful and great to be part of the network and really supportive in the ways that everyone's described in uh, working both with officers and members and uh, from all over the country and um, and learning from others as well. Um, as I say I am struggling to find the slides so I will give up on doing that and I will just improvise. Hooray, I'm sure this was, is for the best, right? Uh, fate's decided that no slides today, which is probably a good thing. Cause I think I heard a psychologist once saying it's terrible to get people to just to stare at a wall, even if it's PowerPoint slides. So I'm learning from that. You can stare at my big, lovely face instead, fantastic. So now I've got to remember what was on the slides, which were my prompt for what I was going to say. So we are delighted um, to be launching the Mentally Healthier Councils Network, as others have said. It's a real opportunity to learn from others uh, with real expertise in the field. And we've heard from two of those experts today. And what's great is, as Andy said, is this, this is now involving officers and members. And um, sometimes as a, as a councillor, I, I really disliked that sort of false wall between officers and members um, because actually local authorities work best when we're all kind of equals we have slightly different roles we bring slightly different um, qualities and connections and expertise to the party but in the end you need you need both I always think uh, really good public health or really good anything really is a, is based on two things good science you know you want to know the 
the the the interventions of things you're doing are based on good evidence and will actually work but you also want community involvement you want um the people that you're trying to support to be working with you to be involved um to be respected uh and to have their ideas um brought into whatever it is you're doing and counselors are able to do that uh bringing the community side and officers with their expertise can bring in the science uh, side of it as well boffening i think jim called it rather beautifully uh, so a bit of boffening and a bit of communitying whatever uh, is another made up word so two good ones um so so i think it's a beautiful thing uh, officers and members and communities are all working together for the common good of the area that they serve and and so that's recognized in the new network and as andy said this is day one we don't want to impose on you how it's going to work we'd love to hear from you what you want to see in it already in the chat we've had sort of requests for various bits of information of the the initiative kaya mentioned with black barbers um jim mentioned um some bereavement and trauma informed work so we'd be delighted to share them as a starter um, but we also want to get out uh into the areas that you're in so at some point we'll be looking at doing a little tour of the nine regions of england we'd love to hear from you um where would be sensible in your region in terms of connectivity and accessibility um, and in due course we'll get out on the road in real life much as we love zoom and teams it'd be great to kind of meet you all in person and hear directly how we can all work together and best practice um, and we'll be building on a track record uh, of working with people all over england and beyond so we're currently doing some great work um, in greater manchester uh, with all 10 boroughs and we've got champions in all 10 boroughs i think it's the first city region um that has that although hertfordshire uh, it would be great to hear from jim that you know completely covered all the district councils and the county council as well um and in greater manchester we're doing some fantastic work with uh, quite intensive work with five of the boroughs for example in trafford we helped co-produce a complex system map of health and well mental health and well-being um factors in trafford which was a really exciting piece of work a bit of boffening but a bit of uh proper community stuff as well and then translating it into genuine action because like jim says it's it's all very well having interesting public health diagrams like the complex system map but what does that mean for people what's it going to change in their lives to make them better how are we going to address the poverty the pollution and all the rest of it that contributes to making people's lives more difficult than they need to be and in local government we have a lot of those levers um, we know that probably something like 80 percent of health outcomes are are not down to clinical care um, and they're things that local government has a really direct input into in terms of the environment in terms of community in, in terms of economic and financial health uh, these are all things that local government has a huge amount of impact on in their areas um, and that's what we want to bring you all together to kind of support each other to get the best we possibly can and learn from each other across england and then um so that's great manchester in west midlands we've been supporting the west midlands combined authority write a brand new mental health strategy and we'll be very eager to work with the west midlands combined authorities councils there there are seven of them and then there's the broader beyond the combined authorities uh, local authorities we'd love to work uh, building on that work in the west midlands and then there's another place called london i'm not sure if you've heard of it um obscure small town in the south um, and we've been working with thrive london uh, and again at a regional level working with them and the local government mental health champions in all the boroughs that they have covered um and and that's the other thing to mention is we're really keen to work at regional government level through combined authorities and others as well as uh counties districts and borough councils because uh, we think there's a real value in working across regions and across city regions um as well as within local authorities so we don't want to have any of these kind of false barriers that we may have referenced so we're really keen uh, for as many people to join as possible we've placed in the chat kind of links to uh, the newsletter and then we'll kind of send more information about kind of formally joining the network and about other opportunities coming up and we'll produce a newsletter we'll put stuff like links to the uh, interesting innovations that we've already heard of 
this afternoon in there and we'd love you to share this information uh, more widely with other colleagues so we can get as many people involved as possible. Um, I'm just trying to think what else was on my slides <laughs> that I have forgotten. Uh, I've covered the three regions and the other information. Um, but as I say, if something, I'll look at the slides afterwards and um, then I will uh, include any information that I've forgotten uh, like that. But I'm sure it was much better looking at my wonderful beard rather than my terrible slides. So uh, we've all got off lightly there. Andy. Thank you, Ed. Um, how about that? You've had a PowerPoint free meeting. Um, so that's got to be good, right? And, and um, thank you to <coughs> our three speakers. Um, this is a genuine exciting day for us. And, and um, I'm really pleased that everyone here has given your time to join us. You're all busy folk. You'll have a lot of things you could be doing. We don't take for granted that you've given us your time today to be part of this conversation. It, it means a great deal. Um, if you sent us a question in advance, um, you don't have to send it again. I've got it here on my little phone. Uh, and so I will be uh, asking um, uh, Jim and Ed some of those questions. I'll get through as many as I can. If you do have any others, pop them in the chat. It's really useful for us to know what you want to know about. So bang any questions in. If we don't get to get them to them today, as I say, they will inform our work going forward with the um, with the network. So nothing will be lost, nothing will be wasted. And um, while we are balancing boffining with community impact, um, which is rather wonderful, um, uh, I'm going to first go to a question we had from uh, Councillor Michael Lilly. Uh, hi, Michael. Great that you could join us today. Um, and uh, you, you asked us in advance, um, what does good practice look like uh, in regard to mentally healthier councils? Big, broad question, but let's start with that because it's great. And um, Jim, I wonder your thoughts in, in a very broadest sense, you know, what, what is a mentally, what would a mentally healthy council look and maybe crucially feel like? Um, I think it would feel like somewhere good to work where tangibly you felt that, that the councillors and the members had a partnership and that um, we genuinely cared about our residents. So when you walked through the door to reception, you were greeted by a smile and you felt people had your back. Uh, and I think there's probably three dimensions to a mentally health for a council. One is how we approach our residents um, and respond to our residents in terms of engaging with them. Not just that this is beyond the services we provide. I think the second is ensuring that the services we provide are all mental health informed and know what to do to signpost people um, and uh, can destigmatize it. And the third thing is our workforce, and I include in that elected member staff and volunteers that we genuinely and really do care about their mental health um, and we do what we can to make sure that they can be as mentally healthy as possible including recognizing um, people living with mental health issues and supporting them through our employment policies so I'd look for those three hallmarks. Thank you and it's really interesting to hear about the intangibles that, that sense of a, a kind of mentally healthy culture. And, and um, in the course of the last decade, I've had the privilege to go to lots of town halls and county halls and, and civic centres and, and whatnot. And, and um, uh, in the very best, you do get that sense of being somewhere where you're a member of a community, not always the case, uh, and you feel welcome. Uh, and and um, I think that probably says a lot. So, so uh, thank you, it's incredibly interesting. Ed, I'm thinking about how we've touched a couple of times during this conversation already on the notion that mental health is about more than just health or the public health specific responsibilities. And, and um, taking Michael's question, I'm wondering about your thoughts about some of the other areas where a council can maybe be mentally healthy in terms of things that don't feel like their health. Thank, yeah, thanks very much for that. That's useful because one of the things I forgot to mention is um, that we've just produced a Mentally Healthier Councils Manifesto for the 2023 elections for those that are having them, but it's also obviously relevant for those that aren't having elections in this cycle. And in there, you'll see that we've structured it by um, breaking it down into kind of what 
I'm going to do some boffening now, Jim. Um, social determinants, so things like poverty and discrimination are, are massively uh, influential on people's mental health and indeed their physical health. Environmental factors are also really inf influential. So, you know, do you have access to a park? Are you able to walk safely and comfortably without breathing tons of air pollution down to your local town centre and access good community services? Um, and, and then there's behavioural aspects again these are really affected by how much money you have and the environment you're in but how do we support people to uh, someone mentioned gambling policy um, off license policy um, planning policy that that puts restrictions or otherwise on the quality of food that people are able to access uh, all of these are really important and then there's there's direct services as well substance misuse services sexual health services um domestic violence kind of services and, and children's services and things like that. Local government has all of these levers at its disposal uh, that have a massive impact on mental health. And what I love about public health is that kind of everything affects public health and mental health. And so with, with its breadth, local government has an enormous kind of role to play in influencing all of these factors and doing it ideally in a way that, like Jim said, with kind of compassion and creating a kind of loving environment. Um, it, it is a bureaucracy, local government, but its purpose is to serve the people that live in its its area, uh, and to do that without forgetting that it's about people, that it's not just a machine, um, that it's it's about in relationships and making those relationships healthy and productive. Thanks, Ed. Um, some really interesting stuff coming in the chat. I'm just going to briefly touch on that before I go back to the questions that have been submitted. Um, uh, Michael, really interesting point about parish and town councils. Um, I know this is something that's happened in a number of areas. Uh, Telford and Narekin is another where, where um, councils kind of, if you like, at, at the level below district and borough have um, got involved. Absolutely. Um, uh, we we welcome everyone to our network, no matter what 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 level of local authority you're at. And um, one of the great things that the champions are able to do at district or borough level is to support those at parish and town council level to to be part of that. And and um, it, I guess it's a cascading system, isn't it? Really. And and um, the more of that, the better. Um, Claudia, great question about translating into community languages. Uh, fundamentally important that good quality information gets to people. We've been really impressed with what many councils have done through the Better Mental Health Fund, which, which was government funding for 40 of the most uh, deprived economically local areas in the country. And um, a lot of the things that they were doing were, were uh, initiatives that, that sought to support mental health within particularly disadvantaged and marginalised communities and, and taking evidence based interventions, but working alongside community organisations to be the delivery bodies rather than the council necessarily doing everything. Uh, and of course, when we're talking about translation, also important for people with sensory impairments too. So, so um, worth remembering, translation means means multiple different um, uh, things. OK. Um, I wanted to move to a question, slightly different question from Councillor Neil Nerva. Thank you, Neil, for this question. Um, asking, how can an improved community mental health offer keep people out of hospital? This, I think, relates very much to, to what Kaya was talking about, about the importance of earlier intervention uh, and preventing problems where possible and, and meeting people early with effective support so that you don't need um, both the distressing and expensive experience of, of having to use uh, inpatient services. Um, uh, I'll start with you this time, Ed, if that's all right. Um, right. Well, that's a really difficult question, Neil, but I'll do my best to answer it. I mean, it's about trying to, it's understanding what causes or exacerbates uh, mental health conditions and then seeking to intervene as early as possible. So like I've said, we know that poverty ex, you know experiencing poverty experiencing discrimination experiencing poor housing um, and other other things in your community are going to exacerbate uh, your or worsen or even create mental health problems in the first place so easier said than done but councils should do their best to try to alleviate those pressures in the first place and then um, there are other things that you can do um, I visited mosaic clubhouse a couple of weeks ago which is a fantastic model from america where uh, people with 
um, mental health conditions are encouraged to become members. It's free. It's commissioned by the local council and the local NHS working together. Um, it's not like an old fashioned day centre. People go there to learn new skills. They work in the kitchen to produce, you know, healthy meals for each other they work in the garden they do the driving to pick people up they deliberately understaff the center so that that members are encouraged to do some of the roles work on the reception desk and i've seen you know remarkable kind of transformations in people's health by being involved in that community they've got loving relationships they've got purposeful activity uh, many of them are helped back into employment in a supported way um, and so they're those kinds of services that councils can commission um, and be involved with that that address a lot of the the loneliness, the isolation, the lack of money, the lack of skills, the lack of access to decent housing and advice. And it does that all in a complete way that addresses people's whole beings rather than just a, a clinical response, which sometimes is appropriate. And it also has an evening sanctuary where people can go if they're in crisis and hopefully avoid ending up in a police cell or in a, in a in a hospital ward, although the latter may sometimes be appropriate too, but um, it does help to have other alternatives that the council can help facilitate. Brilliant, thank you, Ed. Um, Jim, I don't know if you have anything you wanted to add to that. A, a couple of things. So I think the first thing is <clears throat> one of the brilliant things about what Ed just said is that he actually talked about a crucial bit of public health methodology identify the determinants, identify the data, and then identify the interventions. And I think, um, I, I know I bang on about it, but that kind of method in how we do public health is really important. And I think the second thing is the idea of preventive interventions to stop people. So for example, um, uh, we have a program in Hertfordshire called Just Talk for children in, in schools where we have peers where they can talk to one another and do low level interventions. Low level access to stuff will often stop people needing higher access to stuff. Um, and good behavior by clinicians on good practice. So don't prescribe antidepressants as the first off in line with nice guidance can, can, can stop that. So I think we have to see a good community offer as essential to stopping hospital admissions. And actually the reason we get so many hospital admissions is because our community offer has been um, neglected in too many places by national finance at the cost of driving everybody into acute hospitals, particularly if you look at eating disorders and particularly if you look at older people's mental health um, uh, and, the, and the mental health of some populations. So I think it's essential if you wanna get rebalanced, you have to build, um, uh, uh, from the ground up, from the very lowest interventions, right up to the most um, intensive um, uh, and enduring ones. We're sometimes asked in mental health, aren't we, to either focus only on prevention or only on services, and within services, only certain types of service. And you wouldn't expect to do that in physical health, and nor should you. Uh, yeah. I think pushing back against that and seeing that there is a range of things you can do at every level of need, at every age, for every community is so important. We shouldn't have to choose. Um, uh, and, and if we have that notion of parity of esteem for mental health, that we care about it as much as physical health, we shouldn't have to be just doing one thing. Um, there was a question which came in from Phil Ainsworth that rather than putting to the speakers, I want to put to everyone. So, so um, uh, get ready to, to use the chat function. We're gonna try this. I don't know if it will work, but hive mind, I am confident it will. Um, uh, Phil asked, we know that so many of things affect our mental health, very true. If you could choose just one thing for a council to prioritise, what would it be? So what's the one thing you would like your council, the one you work in or you're a member of or you're connected to, what would be the one thing you would like it to do to focus on to, to improve the public's mental health? Pop it in the chat um, and in the last five minutes or so of this meeting, we'll see what comes up. Please do use it. Please do... Um, let us know your thoughts. There are no wrong answers. I'm just interested in your right answers. There we go. Uh, Ed has already put his in. Great, all good things coming in. Keep them coming in. All the answers will be right and they will all help us understand what you're into. In the meantime, there's a really interesting and quite specific question that came in from uh, Yusuf from um, Durham. Thank you for this question. Um, should councils sign up to the mental health at work commitment and why, or I suppose theoretically, why not? Um, 
Jim, what's your thought about this? You work in a council. Um, I would say absolutely. So, um, uh, and I'm just noticing Councillor Turbot Delov's point from Hackney. So, um, <clears throat> I'm a trustee of St Joseph's Hospice in Hackney. And actually, we have a mental health offer for our staff and volunteers that's really crucial for keeping staff healthy. And I think um, looking at this council, we have a mental health offer for the county council and for the district and borough councils. So I would say after the pandemic, the amount of stress and strain with the cost of living of uh, problems as well creates so many things that if councils aren't, councils aren't doing stuff about the mental health of their staff, then I, I think we're storing up workforce problems and we're storing up finance problems and we're storing up mental health problems. So I think there is every single reason why we should do whatever we can to make our, our workforce as mentally healthy and cope and be resilient uh, in these challenging times as possible. Otherwise, I think people will just be on their knees. Thanks, Jim. Uh, that's, that's good counsel, as it were, no pun intended. Uh, Ed, this also for me links potentially to some of the discussions we've been having about real living wage and social value procurement. And I wondered if you might bring that in in the last couple of minutes. Yeah, what absolutely. Else you want to say on this topic. Well, thank you for the open invitation. I'll try to not be, take it too broadly. But um, I mean, local authorities and their partners in the NHS are often the biggest economic actors and the biggest employers in any given community. So a, you should be treating, as Jim said, your workforce with respect, paying them properly, being living wage foundation accredited, treating them well, uh, because that's the morally right thing to do. But also it will help you with recruitment and retention. And we know we've got huge vacancy issues in the NHS and um, local government, social care in particular. Um, but also you will going back to looking at the, the, the predeterminants, um, knowing that poverty and lack of useful activity is a real driver of ill health by using your tools as an economic actor and and hopefully other anchor institutions like your NHS partners and universities and others to be paying well treating your staff decently you'll be making a massive difference to a real big chunk of your local population lifting them out of poverty giving them something useful and decent and constructive to do in their communities and that will have a ripple effect onto their their families uh and, and their neighbours and their community. So it's a really relatively straightforward and something that everybody will grasp that we should be treating our staff well, recruiting locally, supporting vulnerable people to take up positions by being more flexible in what we require from people and supporting them into the roles that, um, that we want filled and need filled. Fantastic, thank you. It's definitely much more about looking after your existing workforce, as important as that is. It's also about creating a diverse and representative workforce within the organisation. Some brilliant answers coming in in the chat. Thank you for all of them. Um, some clusters appear, including something around building the workforce, certainly something around early intervention and childhood, uh, and certainly something about economic well-being in its broadest sense. And, and um, some really important reminders of some of the things that, that we've been talking about for decades, such as tackling stigma uh, and misunderstanding. They're all relevant and all important. Um, any other ideas, pop them in in the last couple of minutes. In the meantime, it's my job to bring us to a close at 1 p.m. Timing is important. Um, so I would like to hugely thank our speakers today. Um, I'd very much like to thank the staff team who put this event together to, to Zach and to others within the organization. And of course, Ed, who did a lot of the work behind the scenes, um, as well as being a rather good presenter. Um, I'd also like to thank the Health Foundation. It's through their support that we are able to do this and, and to do this at a, a scale we never imagined possible. So thank you to our friends at the Health Foundation for enabling us to do that. That means a huge amount. But crucially, thanks to you, you're the network, you're the people who will make these things happen, working alongside you as, as uh, members and officers in local government and, and the people who work alongside them we want to be helpful to you. If we can help you do your job even a little bit better, if we can connect you with one another, that's what we want to do. That's what this is all about. So um, thank you for championing mental health in whatever way you do. Thank you for giving us the last hour of your time. We really appreciate it. And we are gonna be coming up and down the country. So tell us if you'd like to host us at your town hall or county, county hall, 
we'd love to come and be there and spend time with you uh, and, and to get back out on the road again. In the meantime, take care, enjoy your afternoons and, and thank you for, for the last hour. Take care, everyone.